Hello and welcome to New Pod, the monthly podcast where Earth Sky Lab meets Numa Studio to discuss building a better future for humanity. The purpose of the show is to reach an audience of like-minded individuals and develop a discourse around our own personal practices. I'm Ramsey Yasser, a spatial practitioner from London. In 2019, I set up NUMA, a collaborative platform concerned with turning disused space to public advantage. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you my co-host, Victor Borski. Hi, Ramsey. Thank you. It's definitely exciting times we're in now, and I think it's a good time to talk about the future uh, because... Well, uh, I think the future will be different than people expected uh, just a few months ago. And also, for me, talking and thinking about the future helps me ground myself in some sort of hope and positivity, whilst reading the daily news can easily turn your mood black. So I'm happy you have found the time and we can talk about the future and, and see how things and discuss how we see things roll out. Certainly, Earth Sky Lab, uh, which I've been working on for five years, is actually thinking about how to design and build the environments for this future as we envision it. And maybe some of that will come out during our conversation here today. Great, great. Well, we really wanted to discuss today the emerging trends of remote working. Obviously, this is uh, very much in response to the uh, to the global crisis. I, 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 would, it, I would say... Emerging trend is what it was three or four years ago. Now it's about as, emerg as emerging as a big cloudburst bomb above your house, right? It's, it's kind of like, it's an explosion. It's not an emergence. Okay, I, I can see that's a perfectly, that's a perfectly, <laughs> perfectly valid correction there, Victor. Uh, but could, please, we, I would uh, love to hear a little bit more from you. Uh, about what you see the uh, current situation is. Could you please explain to the audience a little bit more about, about our topic today? Um, we'll run through a few uh, questions for you as well. Yeah, so uh, I've been an advocate for remote work. I don't like the word remote, but whatever, let's go roll with it. It's the mainstream narrative. For working at a distance, I've been an advocate for this for over 10 years. I've been working at a distance off and on for 25 years. I worked a little bit in the office in between as well, but a lot of remote. Uh, and I think it brings many advantages to many people. I acknowledge that some people and some kinds of teams and some kinds of work is more effective or easier done in an office. But I think to many people, working remotely brings big advantages and actually, if you build the right kind of culture and habits, people are discovering it's not as hard as they thought it might be. And in many ways, it's more, you know, it's, it's more fun. So, yeah, I don't even know where to start. Certainly lots well, of people, maybe what my worry is, is that lots of people were pushed into remote work without their intentions, lots of companies, and if they don't do it, trying to follow some of the best practices, because me and many other people in the remote work, world work over the past 10 years, 20 years, have developed a set of best practices and a kind of a professional body of ideas, which shows how to make remote work effective. Well, how to make remote work work in the first place how to make it effective and how to make sure that you know the disadvantages are recognized and that there's team practices which make sure that people don't fall into social isolation that people know what work is going on and so on and so forth great well uh, how could we start with how do you make your distance working work so it's a it's a big, big topic. There is many parts to it. I, I am uh, working, just to give you an idea, let me screen share briefly. This is a project that I'm working on for doing remote work learning. 
and this is the idea space that you need to wrap your mind around you know there's the basics of what is remote work and why remote working habits it's important to realize that yes working from home is great but it also means you have to organize your workspace you have to organize your time and you have a lot of more responsibility for your work environment you know in your office you might hate the color of the carpet or the lighting or whatever well in your home it's your responsibility to make sure that your working environment is actually good and to put in the effort for this uh, there is whole area of communication communication rituals techniques basically remote teams do not stand re uh, negative uh, and bad communication so in an office, you can kind of get away with poor uh, communication within a team. Remotely, they'll break your team and it won't work. So you need a higher standard of communication practices. Of course, meetings, you know, it, I think all of us know how uh, unfun, disorganized or badly, badly planned, badly run meetings are remotely it's even worse uh, leadership i think there is this is perhaps the biggest it's definitely the biggest challenge to management because remote teams again do not stand poor old school style management management that's based on fear or management that's based on control whether people are at their desk well, that doesn't work. What remote teams need is leadership. So they need leaders that motivate the team, that make sure the team has what they need to get the work done, that the team understands what work to do or the organization. So it places, it requires a higher standard of leadership, no longer management. Uh, it needs uh, remote teams need you know conscious awareness of how to really build the team spirits and motivation and this goes with a higher standard of leadership you know really continuous learning becomes quite important because even though the remote work like i say we have a good body of knowledge de developed around remote work it's still quite new to humanity so this is growing and best practices and new ideas are coming out regularly. So creating an environment of continuous learning is really important for remote teams. There is the tools, which actually, as you can see, I place pretty far down because I think it's not about the tools, it's about the culture that you create. How you hire, you know, the culture, creating social spaces is important remotely. And, uh, Another idea which I would, I guess, like to end with is that remote work is not a thing of its own. It's part of a whole body of ideas, kind of future of work, so to speak, uh, learning organizations, celebrity developmental organizations, teal servant leadership. There's a huge body of work of how we can better organize and work together collaborate together, how we can better lead teams together, which remote work fits into and really relies on to get teams to work together effectively. Uh, well, that's a really interesting point you've ended on there. So you're saying that the, the uh, management is a very important aspect of remote work. Yes, and what I believe is actually that management there's no more management. To me, management means, you know, the, the typical manager is this master guy who knows what everybody should be doing and knows how to do it better than them and tells everybody what to do. Whilst a, a leader I envision is somebody who inspires, you know, inspires a team to do their best, uh, shares with the team the vision of what needs to be done, uh, gets people excited, and then gets out of their way, but supports them as they do the work. But quite often you, you have a distinction between the um, manager and a leader, right? So a, a leader is there as, as, an, as a source of inspiration, a, a driver in a project. 
but there needs to be somebody who has the technical know-how, who, who has the ability to enforce a certain management style or management system. I mean, I looked at your list there that, that you know, you had a lot of contemporary management systems like Kanban and, you know. Uh, so I wouldn't call those management systems. I would call those collaboration frameworks because something like Kanban is for visualizing work to enable everybody in the team to see what's going on and collaborate better. But you could accept that a, a leader might not necessarily be very good at, at, at or very effective at applying Kanban or, you know, applying yes. Agile or so applying Scrum is, or whatever it is you're using, yes. right? So, I mean, let's stick to Kanban as nice and blowing. So then there is a role for coaches that help the team adopt this or, but that's very different from a manager. A manager is a boss right? I tell you what to do. If your team is not very good at applying Kanban effectively, get a Kanban coach for a few sessions who will empower the team and get everybody to figure out how to make it work for them. Mm -hmm. And so, this is not just, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, because another important idea, this is not just related to remote work. You're familiar with the term VUCA. V no, I'm not, I'm not. Volatile, talking. uncertain. Oh, shit. What were the other ones? I always forget it. Uh, volatile, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. So this is the world that we live in. It's volatile, so things change quickly. It's uncertain, so there's many things which are unclear. Uh, it's complex. You know, the projects we do, the world we live in, we're realizing is very complex. You know, you often have, uh, for example, many projects involve collaboration by different companies, right? I'm sure you see this in architecture. That creates complexity and ambiguity where, you know, sometimes it's not, sh we're, you know, we're not sure what we want to do. This means, this kind of an environment, the VUCA environment is very much, uh, it, it, it doesn't work with the traditional planning. It doesn't work with management. A manager, you know, in a traditional company 100 years ago, the guy did this job for 20 years. He knew all of the ins and outs, right? And he could tell anybody in his team how to do their job better. Today, the world changes so quickly and the reality is so complex and ambiguous. Only the person who is in that actual position. So let's say, for example, you're sitting in front of a customer and you're trying to make some kind of a project happen. And there's you and there's some other company and this and that. And you know exactly. And if you're empowered and you can be creative, you can come up with a solution which works for you, works for the partners, works for the customer. But it's because you have the context and you engage, you have the power. Your manager, who might have done 50 or 100 other projects, doesn't have all the context. He wasn't there at all of the meetings. So he can't just drop in for 10 minutes or half hour, uh, listen to where you are at and give you a solution. Because he doesn't have all of the context. It's not in his head. Moreover, because the world, both technologies, uh, and our reality changes so quickly, it's not realistic for a manager to grasp all of the knowledge and then know everything. These days, let's say even we're talking about architecture, look at building. The building technologies change every five, 10 years, right? You know, if you want to have a high energy efficiency building, you as an architect, like you have an idea that these standards exist and stuff like this, but you don't know how to do it, right? If you want to do a good project, you bring in an expert Mm. right who knows this area and figure out you know this is what i'm trying to build tell me you know and collaborate mm. so these days in teams i believe you know if you're building a great team your goal should be to hire people that are subject experts or that are better at you at the things that they're supposed to be working on so, okay, th th that brings up a really interesting question for me. You, you, the matrix you presented uh, kind of really presents the picture of a, a, a project team or a, a, a new distance working 
um, program that is at, at its inception, right? So you have the opportunity to establish a new management system, establish a new culture, you know, establish all of these kind of new um, uh, elements of habits, etc., within the team, right? How about you know, with the kind with the current um, issue that we have with the global pandemic, how do you address that with traditional organisations? Uh, you know, be they small, um, you know, two three man operations, all the way up to large corporations. How do you apply your distance working principles to these traditional organisations? Because let's face it they're not gonna they're not gonna completely restructure they're not gonna completely introduce new cultures so if you could sum up a few key uh, there is no sum up but it's a process so i would say that the first and most important thing is to acknowledge that you don't know how to do remote work and that business as usual won't work so Acknowledge that you don't know, put on your humble hat and say, this is a new way of doing things. We got to learn and we probably need to going to change some things of how we relate to each other, the meetings we have and so on and so forth. But it's a big opportunity. So, yeah, I mean, I think that the first thing is the mindset, right? You need to go out of a mindset. We know how to do things. And the older the manager and the more successful, the harder it is for them. In my experience, the people working are more open. It's the experienced managers. And of course, they've been doing things a certain way through their whole career, which might be 20, 30, 40 years, and they've been successful. Uh, now suddenly saying, oh my God, I don't know how to work with the team. I'm going to have to learn things and I'm no longer an expert can be quite humbling for certain people. But I would invite those people to instead say, wow, how exciting. I can get to learn a new skill and maybe we can improve how we work together as a team in general. And there's all these opportunities that will be opened up to me, to my company, to the world. So I think being positive about it and going in with an attitude of learning and let's try, try new things. That's the first and most important thing. Because when you're open to learning, that really opens the door to change, to everything. It opens the door to experimentation. It opens the door to having a positive attitude. Mm. So that's the first and biggest step is open the door to learning. There's a huge amount of remote work, you know, how to start it, et cetera, resources on the internet. I'm making some proposals to clients now. I think, uh, you know, there's the basics of making sure everybody has access to tools and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that, for example, I'm inviting a client that I'm working with and I think every company CEO should do right now is organize a virtual, a, a, a well-facilitated part participative online town hall uh, because, of course, everybody feels uncertain. In all companies, people feel uncertain. Some companies are uncertain what will happen to their business, whether it's going up or down or whichever way. There's lots of uncertainty, and it's important for the leaders to step out front. Also, if this is done well using Zoom or something like this, uh, you can uh, show people how effective online technologies can be. So begin the conversation. Acknowledge the elephant in the room. The world is in a crazy state right now. But, you know, as a company, we're going to try and get through it. So acknowledge the elephant in the room. Start the conversation. I think, uh, you know, there's many, there's many tips uh, for personal work, for teamwork. I think, you know, a simple thing which I would invite everybody to do is starting from agile, agile kind of principles. Uh, create some regular meetings in your team because ad hoc meetings in an office, you can just kind of like walk by, walk into somebody's office and maybe it doesn't bother them. Actually, it ruins their productivity. But I know many companies run this way. Online, it's, a, it's really tough. 
So organize a regular drumbeat of meetings. I think as a minimum, a daily stand-up. So in the morning, everybody calls in and should just be 15 minutes. What, what have you done? What are you doing? Are you blocked on anything? And anything that's longer conversation should be moved aside, but then at least you have everybody in place and you can organize other meetings for that day. So people know when they need to be at their desk, when they have time for their children, because they can step away from the computer. Uh, also, then people know that I will be able to see everybody in my team once a day. So maybe, you know, some key questions I can hold off. I don't have to disrupt this person. I think that's very important. Second is actually social spaces. I really recommend every team start a weekly water cooler call or virtual coffee, however you want to call it. So just one hour, everybody gets together with a coffee. It could be on Friday after work with a beer. It could be one day, Monday for lunch or something together. But people get together online, socially. You can either leave it just generally for open for chit chat or people can have a topic. Certainly there's many things people have discussed now, but the, the goal is to not discuss work stuff, just discuss how is everybody. Mm. You know, for example, parents will exchange tips on how to, what they're doing to keep their kids occupied. Uh, to create this social space so people don't feel isolated. This is a big danger with remote work. And especially at times like this, you know, there are single parents that are stuck in apartments with their children. They're suffering a lot. So creating this social space at least once a week where people can come and hang out and just, you know, see their team members and, and, and be relaxed together and laugh and, and share some jokes is very important. You see, I, I, think, I think what you're doing there is you're addressing, addressing the very obvious psychological impact of, of uh, remote working, right? And I, I think it's interesting that you're addressing it because especially coming from somebody who's very well used to it and very well accustomed to remote working, you've been working on it for, as you say, 20 years, 20 odd years. And, you know, you, you're, you're, you're very much... You, you know, you're probably a leading um, uh, expert on the topic, you know, it, you're still conscious of the psychological impact and the, the mental health issue. And I think that there's a really interesting uh, link there, not just between the idea of social distancing, right, which is what this facilitates, but also the idea of, of your physical space that you inhabit. You know, lots of people live in the countryside or they live in the city but they have a townhouse and they have a big garden um, and they have this opportunity to get a variety of space in their life they have an opportunity to have distance from closed close ones in their lives right but actually when you look at certain cities particularly most cities are really in the world right that they're very highly dense places look at London you know people can often live in a flat they can often live in a flat with, with two three five, six family members, uh, they're all on top of each other. Um, do you feel that the remote working through video conferencing is capable of providing enough of a release? Is there an, is there an opportunity there for it to provide enough of an escape from your immediate physical environment? So let me see if I understand your question. So for, you mean in the case of this COVID emergency right now or in general? Well, I, I think, I think, you know, we can't, we can't avoid the context of the COVID emergency, right? We're in it. We're, we're in it. And it, there's an issue of, there's an issue of, you know, the whole purpose of our discussion right now is the COVID, is the COVID issue because yeah. okay. otherwise, so, you know, in general, uh, with work in general, you know, you go into flow so and your world becomes your document or whatever. So the question is, can you have a quiet enough space where people aren't disturbing you that you can go into flow and focus on what you're working? And I appreciate especially people with children are struggling now, but this is an exceptional situation, right? The schools have shut down. We don't have the social framework of taking care of children. 
outside of the institutions of, you know, the, the formal state institutions. It's a whole separate discussion. So I appreciate that right now it might be really challenging for parents. I'm not a parent myself, so it would be hard for me to speak. But there is a lot of resources for online learning and certainly even children above, you know, the, the tiniest age can be uh, plugged into online learning. There's people having calls with children where the kids can have, you know, online video calls, play dates and stuff like this remotely. So the infrastructure is rapidly building up. But yes, if you're a parent and you have, if you're a single parent, and you have three kids at home in an apartment, my heart goes out to you. That's tough. But that's not a normal situation. And in, in a normal, you know, remote working environment, uh, people don't have to take care of their children 24 7. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. So that, that's a really good point about it not being a normal situation. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your feeling on, on how? on how temporary this situation is and how long we will it's a it, it's well, leading I to mean, another question that's, but... that's going into a pedology and stuff like this i'm not following the things to that level so but let's maybe let's talk about what does this mean for remote work because that's something i think uh, i can that's what exactly what i was leading into yes ah, okay so so it, where, where my question really is is right now this is this is a real boom where what do you think happens once the covid 19 epidemic is over what happens so, to I remote think working there's going to be a combination of there's going to be different patterns i think some people will go like my god the people who don't follow best practices who don't follow the advice i made here or don't get a consultant or don't try and change the way they work Right? The people who don't put their learning hat on are going to go, my God, that was horrible. Thank God we can go back to the office and I can go back to monitoring whether my employees' asses are in their desk by 9 a.m. So there'll be people who do that and, well, God bless their souls, they'll probably never be converted anyways. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I think there's going to be lots of people and companies that will go, wow, that worked, wasn't so bad. It was actually kind of fun and workable in certain in a certain way wasn't so bad well let's try it and let's think of you know whether we incorporate this into our general business strategy or we can have some teams remote or let's continue working on this because we can see the value of this i think there's going to be a lot of people like that uh, there'll certainly be certain i think there's actually probably going to be more employees who will go wow, that was really good. That was actually convenient in many ways. And my company doesn't work. It doesn't allow me to work remotely. Where screw them, I'm going to find another job where I can work remotely, whether fully or some of the time. Uh, so this is a challenge to any organization that's had people working remotely to make sure afterwards, if people are happy to continue this and not try and go back to business as normal. And I don't know, I don't really have, cause I, you know, I work really with future of work and tech companies and all of this. I don't have a sense, will there be more, wow, that was horrible, let's just go back to having people nailed to the desk kind of management people, or will there be more, wow, that kind of work, that was interesting, let's continue experimenting kind of people. What do you think? Uh, I mean, it's, you've just sparked a really interesting thought in my mind. I've not really thought it through, but, um it's a great leveler isn't it it's a great leveler because i think it, it, one of the issues you have is that there are all of these sort of major operations and organizations that are very well established they have their um their big offices full of employees and they have their systems and their traditional management styles and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it actually that creates a massive barrier of, of entry for any fresh talent or any diversity to enter into an industry right because you know you, you just can't compete with the with the big oil tankers you know and suddenly you know it, it, all the big oil tankers are completely leveled with all the other collaborative networks that were just operating with loads of independent people collaborating together and, and pushing projects through together and actually, maybe this is a situation where the big oil tankers can't compete any longer, 
So I think that's, I think that's a very exciting prospect. And I, I definitely think it has a potential to have, have a massive um, shift in, in our, le our levels of innovation and our levels of, of diversity within the, the, you know, the, um, the output of humanity, right? I think there's something very interesting there. Um, so, look, I, I, I don't doubt for a moment. I, I imagine our, um, the, the COVID pandemic is going to be, have a major impact on the old world for 12 to 18 months. I think that's long enough for there to be a paradigm shift when we come out of it. And I, I absolutely agree with you that there will be some companies that will go back to being traditional, you know, office-based, location-based companies. Uh, but I think even they will adopt new ways of working. Of course, it could work out that the world becomes completely unproductive. No one manages to do anything. You know, people look at the numbers, they go, do you know what? Nobody's, none of these businesses are actually managing to survive here. It doesn't work. And it puts an end to the whole idea of remote working. I mean, it's a gamble, isn't no, it? It's no, a gamble no, no. you take. I can tell you for a fact that the companies that work with me for consulting, we've worked with my many of my friends for consulting, are going to discover that actually remote work works. And whilst it has, it does require adjustment and a new mindset. It's actually a good mindset, and uh that it's entirely possible again i don't know i have no idea about the percentages what i believe is that in the long run the advantages that remote work i mean there are disadvantages i'm not uh dismissing that but the advantages that remote work give to individuals which means you have much more freedom you know like what i'm doing which is effectively lifestyle arbitrage Right. I work in the, let's say, the northern European economy and I live in a village, small, small town in the south, in the south, in Europe. And already, right, you know, most, most, I think all countries anywhere in the world, definitely in Europe, if you're earning wages at city rates, but living in the countryside, your lifestyle purchasing is so much greater for anybody in the middle class or, or lower. Uh, you know, if you're rich and if you have your suits custom tailored in London, then yeah, nothing is going to replace London. But for everybody else, especially the struggling middle class, the creative class, the lifestyle advantages of being able to live, you know, like out here, I can imagine owning a house in London, you know, like that slavery for me and my wife for the next 30 years. And even then, it's not a great place. Yeah. So the advantages to individuals will be great. The advantages to especially start, I usually work with startups and small organizations, the ability to source talent uh, at lower rates globally. But also it's not just that when you work re with remotely, it becomes much easier to work with people uh, uh, to hire experts part-time. Right. You know, as a startup to hire a marketing person full time, that's probably it's, it's hard. Right. And or you won't be able to get somebody that's very good. But then if you want to hire a marketer for five hours a week and they have to drag themselves halfway across London to get to your office, that's like an extra three hours. Right. It's no longer attractive. But if they're working remotely, then it's entirely possible. You know, I have many clients at five hours a week. Right. I have one meeting with them. I do some work and I'm in my own place and I can deliver them value. And they, they neither have the budget nor the need to hire me full time. Mm -hmm. Right. So this idea of a mosaic career, uh, there's advantages to small companies and to the people doing this kind of work. You know, I mean, I don't. I don't understand the mental space. I was just talking to a friend that's working at the big bank. They've got thousand people in tech alone in Eastern European country when at that size. And, you know, they got like massive budgets of, you know, tens of millions for projects at that size. They don't care if they're paying two or three times uh, the average salaries of what they could take. So maybe they don't care. 
But I think for small companies, this idea also, you know, was developing much more. Once you start becoming remote, you become more flexible. You know, you can work on a project for a few hours, uh, a week for a month or two, right? It's entirely feasible. You don't have your boss hanging over you. So, yeah, I think the transformation of the workplace, like I say, the remote work is just one part of the whole future of work evolution, revolution, development, uh, and the different parts fit together and reinforce each other. The mosaic careers, the remote work, the new ways of organizing, the more collaborative working style, it all kind of fits together to create a very different world. Fantastic, Victor. So shall we close? Would you like to give uh, Victor's top tips for remote working? Would you like to summarize them? Uh, I don't have this organized, but let me reinstate. Make sure you have social spaces. So don't focus over, don't over focus on being, I describe it as trying to be so efficient that you stop being effective. We're all still humans. And especially at a time like this, where we're all vulnerable humans, it's important to give people enough space, social space, uh, through company town halls, water cooler calls, etc., that people can talk about it, but not so much that everybody goes into the dark hole of despair of panic where we're all doomed. So there's a balance there. Uh, bring in a regular schedule of meetings. So within a team, have your meetings regular, weekly or biweekly, uh, or daily as it makes sense and it's better to have a regular meeting and cancel it once in a while oh this week anybody have anything to talk about no okay we cancel it then it is to try and schedule an ad hoc meeting ad hoc scheduling becomes a pain in the ass really quickly if you're working with clients or something that's not within a team then make sure you schedule the next meeting before the end of the current one because everybody's on the, on the call uh, and it's easy to get everybody to pull up their calendars. It might seem like a waste, but those extra five minutes save everybody a lot of hassle. Those, those I would say, are just kind of simple tips. And if you even just start doing that, that will already move your remote work to a comfortable level. And after that, there is lots and lots of things you can do to make it super effective and really smooth. But if you do the things which I just said now, that already make it comfortable, I believe. And just to, on a final note, to dumb down the conversation ever so slightly, how, what do you think about just the, the general setup? You know, if, if some people were thinking about setting up now for, for effective remote working, what would you be able to recommend the minimum basic hardware that you think people should be investing in and the, well, I mean, for how, uh, and, and also the, 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 you know, any essential software applications that you see as being really useful for, to, so, to achieve this. Certainly everybody has email, but email is shit. Try and not use email. I think uh, having a, a text chat, but text chat with topics, right? I mean, even if you're a team of a few people having like, you know, the work chat or the sales chat and then have a water cooler, so like random general chit chat chat. So have channels and, and the random channel is also good somewhere where people can chit chat comfortably. So, so just, just to explain that, would you, if we were to use WhatsApp as an example, would you have multiple WhatsApp threads? Yes. And in WhatsApp, yeah. you can name channels. So make sure you name the channel and you give it a nice icon, right? I just like to spend three minutes, you know, if it's the sales one, go to Google, Google image search, click on sales guy and that steal the image and put it in the chat so then people can see visually what each chat is. It's a small thing, but it's like decorating an office. You're decorating your virtual office. Great tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So get people to use chat effectively. Another tip, if you get to the point where it's starting to feel things are uncomfortable or conflicty or whatever, always go one level up in communication. So if somebody sends you an email and they like sound 
angry or short with you or whatever, then text chat them. Don't answer the email because that's not going to go anywhere. It just get worse. Text chat them and say, oh, you sent me this email. It sounds like maybe you're upset. Can we talk through it? Okay, great. If text great, chat great, is great, not great, helping. Sorry then call them. Don't even bother. Don't even go in a, like if your thread is like more than five, 10 messages in chat and you're still not getting clarity and coherence, just say, please, can we call? Don't even, don't call. Just say, please, I need to talk with you. Just 10 minutes, give me 10 minutes of your time. Yeah. Uh, because it's very easy. This is what I was trying to say. I didn't have depth to get into in communication. Uh, Ah, yes, I would say my last and most important, most important, important tip for remote work and for these times now is give people the benefit of the doubt. If they didn't get the work or you think they didn't get the work done or it wasn't a poor quality, give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe their children are crying. Maybe they didn't know. They didn't know what you expected. Just ask them nicely and say, you know, I expected something else. You know, what happened? You know, just like mm. be nice. Because everybody is, we're in a time where everybody in the world is struggling in one way or another. So be nice, give people the benefit of the doubt, which doesn't mean accept whatever, communicate your need, but try and do it in a nice way. Great. Well, I think that that's a tip that we should follow generally in life, let alone just for remote working. Yes, this is the great thing that the remote, the good skills for remote working are the same as good skills for good teamwork in an office. This is the nice thing that whatever you learn to be good for remote work will be completely useful when you go back to the office. Great, Victor. Cool. Thank you for the conversation. Sorry if I spoke too much, but I'm really excited about this topic and I've been thinking about it for 10 years. So it's nice people are listening finally. No, it's uh, an incredibly great addition to the topic that you've given us today, Vic. So thank you very much. Thank you.